this working? Okay. Well, thank you very much for that warm welcome. And it's great to be here today. It's an honor to be speaking, and I thank, um, I thank all of you for being here. I see some familiar faces in the audience that, uh, that I've been with for quite some time. And I have been a private practice owner for over 20 years in Huntington Beach. And I began um, my aquatic therapy with an injury that I had on my own. I had a, hand, a couple hand surgeries and an elbow uh, nerve issue. And I used aquatic therapy to rehabilitate myself. And at that point, I found out what a great power the water has. And so I decided to open and create um, and build a pool. I um, have a definite passion for treating chronic pain and CRPS. Everybody has a personal story, so I'm going to share briefly my personal story with you. I start, I, um, in 2005, I was diagnosed with a nerve compression injury to my foot while I was training for a triathlon, and it was a sprint triathlon, very small triathlon. And it took a while to get diagnosed, but when I did, I ended up having surgery. And three weeks later, I fell and had a staph infection, and it was a pretty bad staph infection. It took a while to, come o to, uh, to get over. So basically, during that time, I experienced a lot of coldness, burning. I couldn't walk. And I used what I see a lot of you using today, the roller aid. That was my favorite. And um, crutches, and I have some crutches I'd like to share with you after the whole, uh, that, that kind of saved me because they were designed differently than the typical crutch. So um, I had to figure out and do a lot of research to find a solution because I kept being told by the physicians that I was seeing that I had to live with it. So what I did is I found a surgeon across the country on the East Coast who was confident he could help me, and he did. So I had a second surgery because I had a lot of scarring from the staph infection, um, and my symptoms proved, improved dramatically over the next six months. And I was able to walk again. And I'm very, very thankful and grateful for that. In 2010, I completed the triathlon again that I was training in 2005. And aquatic therapy was a very, very large part of my recovery, which is why I have such a passion for it. It not only saved me physically, but it saved me mentally because I was able to move and I was able to work my body while I was recovering. But the one thing that I can't forget during the whole process was that burning pain and waking up feeling like your foot is literally in a bucket of fire. And I said to myself, if somebody has to live with this every single day, I need to become a part of that solution because I can't imagine having to deal with that every day. And there was an end to mine, which again, I'm very grateful for. So today, I've been asked to speak about a couple treatment options. I'd like to make this as practical as possible for you. It's on how to retrain your brain and the benefits of working your body and your mind in the aquatic environment. I'm sure you've all heard the saying, it takes 10,000 hours or 10 years to master a skill or a sport. Well, obviously, it's not going to take you that long for the brain retraining techniques or the aquatic therapy, but what it is going to take is a lot of persistence and being very consistent with doing these types of programs. And hopefully, what I'm going to try to do during this presentation is give you resources along the way that you can write down so it's practical for you and you can I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of everything, but because I don't have the time, I'd like you, if you are interested, to go ahead you know, and, and look up the websites and look up more information on your own so that if you need to, you can find a physical therapist to help you with these types of techniques. Last summer, I attended a research conference in Rhode Island on the biopsychosocial aspects of pain, and this was for a week. There were PTs and psychologists from all over the country, all over the world, actually. And they were all there to find better ways of treating chronic pain. So it was very, very exciting because they're finding new things and new hope for chronic pain. So I'd like to go ahead and get started. I'm going to have a little bit of water. 
And I will tell you the videos that you're going to see are nothing like Bradley Cooper, so I just have to say that up front. <laughs> Not nearly as exciting. So today I'm going to focus on brain retraining, laterality training, explicit motor imagery and mirror therapy, and finally aquatic therapy. But first I'd like to ask a couple of questions because this will sort of lead into the, um, the brain retraining. And I want to show of hands, pain only occurs when you are injured. Is that true or false? The brain decides when you experience pain. The brain decides when you experience pain. Is that true or false? Mm -hmm. Chronic pain means an injury has not healed properly. Mm -hmm. So in chronic pain and CRPS, chemicals associated with increased stress can directly activate nerve sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So pain is real. It comes from a lot of different factors, but it is very, very real. Your brain creates the pain. It's a warning system and a protection mechanism that sometimes gets out of whack. You look at phantom limb pain, you have pain in a limb that doesn't even exist. What is that about? I had a patient to come in so that I could um, train him in mirror therapy, and he had, was above knee amputee. And he was sitting in a chair, and he said to me, I feel my foot on the floor. The foot that does not exist, I feel, on the floor. It's, it's crazy, some of the things that, that you hear like that. Pain is, con is, is all about context, what you believe, where you are, what you think, what you understand. Pain may increase with thoughts of pain, anticipation. I know I'm going to have pain when I get out of bed or when I walk. I had another patient that came to me a few weeks ago, and she had some concerns, and she said, and she was a nerve, she had nerve injury um, and nerve, a lot of nerve pain and burning in her foot. And she woke up and she didn't have any pain and she was in bed. And she said, as soon as I started thinking about it, I started having pain. So it was interesting just to think of it sometimes in that way. So it's, it's in, all about the context sometimes. So here, this book, the Explain Pain Handbook, it's called the Protectometer. And this is a great resource if anybody wants to write this down. Um, Laura Mosley and David Butler out of Australia have done a lot of research. They're physical uh, therapists and neuroscientists that have done a lot of research with these techniques that I'm going to be talking about. And basically what that shows is you're in a bathtub or you're in your life and you have all these things that you're dealing with and then all of a sudden, even if it's a cute little thing and they call it a bilby, you guys know what that is, um, jumps into the bathtub, or jumps into your life, and then all of a sudden, everything gets out of control, and your sensitivity in your nervous system just gets heightened, and you have a lot of pain. So it can be just one tiny little thing that can cause that. So next, we're going to talk about the homunculus. And that's that little man in your brain. That's the Latin word for little man. So we all have a little man in our brain. And what this is is a motor and sensory cortex brain map. It's a representation of the sensation in the motor system in your brain. So you can see there is a bigger representation of the face, of the hands, of the feet, of the lips, because that is where we get more of our sensory feedback from and more motor, our hands. We do a lot of fine motor skills, so the hand is a very large representation. They've done studies where in blind people, because they use their hands to read, the representation of the hand is larger in the brain in a blind person. Here's another example of a brain map. So that is, that is the area where the somatosensory cortex is, and this is where the representation of the body parts are. And you can see this, this guy. Uh, large hands, large feet, lips and tongue. We get a lot of our sensation from those areas. So the representation of the body in the brain is very important. What happens with the brain's image of a painful body part? What can happen is smudging. The image of your affected limb is not as defined in the sensory or motor area of the brain, which can lead to spreading of CRPS, some have found. If you hear someone calling the hand, the foot, 
and giving your, the body part a separate name, there may be a, dis a dissociation, may not be as clear of a representation of that body part in the brain. So listen to the words that you hear and that you're saying. How do we get it to go from focused or non-focused to very focused in the brain? How do we do that? We can do brain retraining for CRPS, and that is a treatment that's focused on training the brain to reconnect to the body part that's affected by pain. So the goal of this type of treatment is to activate the brain to reconstruct that body part without increasing activation of the severe pain state. We do not want your pain state to be elevated to the level where you can't do anything, where you have so much pain. We want to try to be able to work it so you don't have as much pain when you're doing this. And the brain is plastic, you've, you've all heard that. So there is ways you can retrain the brain just like anything else, just like retraining your muscles. It's the same thing, the brain is a very big muscle. The NOI group, Neuro Orthopedic Institute out of Australia, again, they've done so much research. There are three types of graded motor imagery. And the first one is left and right discrimination. The second one is explicit motor imagery or motor imagery. And the third one is mirror therapy. And the research has shown that to go in that order can give the best results. So that's what we're going to start with. Phase one is left and right discrimination or laterality training, it's called. It's the ability to identify a body part as right or left. And the goal, again, is to reconstruct a clear representation of the left and right body part that's affected. This is an app, and I have to make a disclaimer, I forgot to say it. Um, I have no financial interest in anything that I'm going to be showing you. I just want to make that, that clear. Um, this is an app that the Neuro Orthopedic Institute in Australia has put out called Recognize, and the S, obviously, that's an Australian. You can get it on Android, I think it's about $8.99, Android um, app or Apple app, and you can put it on your phone and on your um, tablet. It goes through three different types of brain training techniques for the particular body part. So if you have a foot problem, it has a vanilla foot, which is just basic images, context feet, which get a little bit more challenging, and abstract feet. So all these are three different levels of trying to retrain your brain. It first comes, the default is 20 images. So you look at 20 images, and you have five seconds to pick left or right, and it actually keeps track of your score. So you can see this, so it's, really, it's a really useful tool because you can do it anywhere. So here's an example of a picture, and that's a vanilla foot, plain background, not too hard, and you would, you would push left or right as fast as you could. Here's an example of a context foot. It's black and white, somebody's holding it, it's a little bit more complex of a picture, a little more, a bit more complex of activity going on there. Here's a picture of a Hawaiian foot in the same context, a fun foot. The next one is an abstract foot. So this is a higher level where it's more difficult for your brain to discern if it's right or left. And here we have another abstract foot. So different types of training that goes on in your brain, and the point is to do it often. So with this laterality program, the frequency is usually three to five times a day. The duration is 20 to 50 images per session for a minimum of two weeks to start, and this again is phase one. The goal is to get an 85% accuracy for both left and right, both of your sides of your body, in less than two seconds. And again, the Apple and Android app. And they have many different types of body images. So they're not only looking at the hands and the feet to do this training with, they're also looking at, they have a neck app, shoulder, knee, and back. So they're looking at all different body types because chronic pain falls into this category. Any kind of chronic pain that you've had, you're gonna have a little bit different representation in your brain of that body part. If you have increased pain, you want to decrease the image frequency or the challenge. Because with this particular 
technique, the graded motor imagery, you do not want to have increased pain when you're doing any of these exercises. The next phase is phase two, and that's motor imagery. So that would be, and you've heard a lot about visualization. Sports people do it all the time. Dr. Olson was just talking about it. Visualize you know, yourself being in a, in a good place, and that can help decrease your pain. Well, if you visualize yourself moving or in a certain position of motion, that actually does help you move. It retrains your brain to be able to move without pain. You can watch another person's body part in a magazine or out in public. You can imagine yourself moving or doing a certain movement, a sport or walking. You can look at different pictures of the body in magazines, differentiating from right or left. I had a patient, um, she was young, she was 15, and she was a dancer, and she could not watch dancing, and she had CRPS in her foot. She could not watch, watch dancing without getting her CRPS symptoms. I mean, it was there was a direct relationship between her watching dancing and getting her CRPS symptoms increased. So it's very, very interesting. So you can look at piano playing and look at left or right. With piano playing, you can look at pictures of people walking, somebody doing something with their hands if you have an effect with your hands. Now, one of the comments that I've got is that sometimes if you were look at pictures of yourself, there is definitely an emotional response that could occur. So you may not be ready for that. So you may want to just look at something that is sort of disconnected from you, like a magazine or the television. And then you can gradually work into looking at pictures of yourself before this occurred and looking at your, your um, image of your body part. If you're tired of looking at people, you can look at animals. <laughs> This is actually on the web. This is Norman, the biking dog. <laughs> it's a resource for you, too, if you need a laugh. So for motor imagery, the frequency is three to five times a day. You're beginning with three minutes and increase to 10 minutes at a time for a minimum of two weeks. And again, if you have pain, if you have pain increase, you want to decrease the time and the frequency or go back to the laterality training. So you can kind of shift between the phases. The third phase is mirror therapy. This is the one people hear about the most, developed by, or developed and used quite a bit by Dr. Ramachandran, who is in San Diego in the neuroscience department at UCSD. He's done a lot of research with phantom limb and that type of thing. It is the use of a mirror to present a reverse image to the brain. And the goal, again, is to reconstruct a more clear representation of the body part in the brain. You don't want to have any jewelry on. The limb should be the same as the other side. And basically what we're doing is tricking your brain. And I'll show you how in a minute. You can make them from anything. It's very cheap. This, this entire program is very inexpensive. You can take a box, that mirror from Home Depot, a 12 by 12 mirror, tape it on a box, and you've got yourself a mirror box. Or you can buy one online. And it folds up, and you can take it with you if you want to practice it, going to different places. You can buy them for the foot and for the hand. So initially, you want to look at an image of the body part in the mirror first. You could even start with a picture, if that is too difficult. You can start with a picture. Then you look at the mirrored body part with no movement. Then you can look at it with the body part moving. You can introduce different tools, pens and, and objects, and lifting cups, and doing things that you can't normally do you can do that with the mirror. So you can also have music playing or television playing. The more that you feed your brain with the different contexts, the more your brain is going to reconstruct a better picture of that hand or that foot or that affected body part. Here's an example. So on the left, she has her right hand, let's say the, the painful hand, in the mirror box. Her left hand is facing the mirror. She's looking at the mirror, and what the brain sees is a painless right hand. And that's how you're tricking the brain. The right hand, the left hand is just sitting, or the right hand is just sitting in the box. And you see on the other side, on the, on the right, she's doing an activity. So the brain is registering her using that right hand, squeezing a ball, and not causing any pain. 
But that's how the mirror therapy works. You can use a long mirror. If you have an entire leg, you can use a long mirror. That's you know, five, ten dollars from Target or wherever. And you can do the same thing. You can use mirror therapy doing functional activities. If you have trouble, let's say, washing your face, your brain, her brain right now is registering her right hand washing the face. So that is a way that you can use mirror therapy. It is an image. The frequency, again, is three to five times a day. Duration, one to 10 minutes. I've heard up to an hour, so there's really no set exact protocol. The minimum is two weeks, usually takes longer. If you have pain, you can go back to phase one or two. Brain retraining takes constant effort, just like weight training or anything else that you try to do, losing weight, getting in shape. It takes constant effort and persistence, and it's the same with this type of program. So the next I'm going to talk about aquatic therapy, which is my huge passion. I call it the bridge to land. This is something I brought to the clinic the other day. <laughs> and somebody who's sitting in this audience, she asked me, she was in the deep end, just hanging. And she said, can you bring me lunch? Because it feels really good in here, and I really don't want to get out. So this is what just reminds me of her. And a lot of patients say that, too. They just don't want to get out because it feels so good. But what is the difference between aquatic physical therapy and aquatic exercise? So aquatic physical therapy requires a skilled service of a PT or a PTA. So we, we look at your impairments. We figure out an individualized program for you and a plan of care. Work with your doctors if we have to, you know, whatever, whatever um, the patient needs. Um, we, we provide that. It is covered by insurance, but you want to check your plan. And there is a CPT code for it, just like any other rehabilitation code. So it's no different. It's under the umbrella of physical therapy. Aquatic exercise is just the utilization of water for implementation of quality of life, fitness-related or general health-related goals. And this is from the Aquatic Section website of the American Physical Therapy Association. So this is another good, uh, another good resource for you to look up if you want some more information. The question I get asked a lot is, does water temperature matter? I hear everybody, yes, 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 it matters. And it does matter. The therapeutic temperature is 88 to 94 degrees. So everybody knows the benefit. It decreased muscle guarding, relaxation, less pain. I mean, if my temperature in the pool at my office goes down one degree, I hear about it. I mean, really, I, I hear about it. Commercial pools generally are 78 to 85. And that's for moderate to high activity level, like swimming or water aerobics. And if you can do that, that's great. The spot temperatures are usually 100 to 104 degrees. So that's, you know, depending on what your tolerance is, um, you can get in. But I suggest if you go away to a hotel, if you go away, you know, to some place that has a pool, you just buy a thermometer at a Home Depot or wherever. It's under $10. You buy a thermometer, and you check yourself what the temperature of that pool is that you could use to make sure that it's something that would be um, worthwhile for you. So what are the benefits of aquatic therapy? Many, many, many. Buoyancy is one of the benefits, which is huge, and everybody recognizes that as soon as you get in. It supports the body, reduces stress, gives you flexibility, range of motion, joint decompression. It just, it just feels good. And it reduces stress in the entire nervous system, which is very, very important. As with CRPS, there is a sensitized nervous system. So that is a really important benefit. We have... Graded weight-bearing. So you can be begin walking and weight-bearing when unable to do so on land. Your recovery is faster. If you have CRPS and you're not able to put weight on your foot, this is a great place to start because we know that with CRPS, we've got to get weight through that lower body. It's made to accept weight. So as much as you can, even if you're up to here, which takes off about... 80% of your body weight, it's better to put some weight on it if you can possibly do it because it is so important to get weight through those long bones in your body. 
You can work on balanced activities, functional activities, and weight shifting. There's the ability to have gentle graded resistance. So you're able to progress yourself at an individual challenge level. She's starting out really slow. So think about that. If you have, if you have CRPS in your upper body, just getting the feeling of the body through your joints, through your arms, through your muscles. And then you can increase. She's increasing her speed a little bit. And that helps to increase some of the challenge to your body. So you can do it at your own individual pace. And you can progress as slow as you need to or as fast as you, as you can. Next is graded resistance. And this is with some equipment. Body conditioning is huge. To have improved heart and lung function and circulation just by moving. It increases with the, um, or the hydrostatic pressure actually helps to decrease the swelling. So when you go in the pool, it's like having an ace bandage around or a compression sleeve around your lower extremity. You have less swelling when you get out, and I've visibly seen this. I've seen patients go in with a bluish and, and, and swollen foot and come out with better coloring and less swelling. It's really sometimes a marked, marked improvement. The more oxygen to the body promotes healing and more oxygen to the brain helps with stress and brain retraining, which promotes healing as well. Here's just some types of aquatic exercise equipment. Some of it's buoyant and supportive. Some of it's resistant, or not resistant, resistive. And one of the best benefits that I have seen, I think one of the most powerful benefits is the psychological benefit. You have the freedom to move without fear. All you need to do is to move to feel the water and don't worry if the movement is perfect. It doesn't matter. You're gonna be activating muscle groups that have been dormant for a long period of time. That is where you're gonna start your foundation. So you can start your foundation slowly. And also aquatic therapy promotes better sleep. I hear that all the time because you're moving, you're using your muscles and it promotes better sleep. So what are some of the aquatic physical therapy program components that we typically do. I'm very exercise based. There are a lot of other different types of techniques out there for aquatic therapy, manual techniques, floating people and all that. Um, my program is more, more exercise based. So I can start with some of the walking as a warm up, and then we just go to some gentle stretching. You can hold, you can use the stairs um, three to five times. So we start a little bit with that. You can use a buoyant noodle. You can use a noodle to help with the stretching a little bit if you need some extra support. So we do part that, and then we move into the shallow water. So shallow water is typically three to five feet. And you can walk forwards and backwards, side to side, work on balanced proprioception. You can work on functional activities. And this model here is in the room. So you can work on stepping. So if you have trouble going up and down stairs, you can work on that in the pool and get yourself more confident to be able to do that activity. Functional squats, the other model is in the pool. I mean, this is right over here. <laughs> you can do functional squats. So you can do activities that you can't do on land a lot easier. And if you don't have a bench in the pool, you can try doing functional squat. We use TheraBand in order to keep a better alignment because typically when people are weak, their knees kind of go in more. So if you use TheraBand on the outside of your knees, there's a better alignment usually. And here's an example of that. Perfect form. You can do balance activities. She's um, using a TheraBand right here. You can go on to core stabilization and balance. So you can add, you can use a noodle, you can use buoyancy equipment with resistive equipment. Right now he's working many, many things. He's working his balance, he's working his core stabilization, he's working his leg muscles, he's working his arm muscles, so he's doing a full body movement. And he has CRPS, and very badly, but he is able to do these things in the water. So there's also deep water. And if you can find a pool that has deep water, I highly recommend going into the deep water because you just feel weightless. And there's nothing like it. 
when you're in pain to feel no weight on your body. So you can hang, decompress. You can do activities like running, like just gentle running. Just do some things that you used to do before and, and try to mimic those movements. You can use buoyancy equipment, resistive equipment. Here's an example of deep water hanging, decompression. You can put a noodle under your arms if you can't hold something, or you can just use a belt. So there's different ways you can modify it. You can use deep water conditioning or do deep water conditioning. So she's just doing a gentle biking motion. She's working on her motion in her knee, perhaps her ankle. We're having to do an ankle movements at the same time. And it's gentle, and you can go as slow as fast or as fast as you can tolerate. Here's another example of deep water conditioning, it's like cross-country movement. So you're moving your whole body. Again, this is a full body movement. You're working your heart, your circulation. Go as slow or as fast as you want. You can put fins on your ankles to make it more resistive. So there's ways of strengthening that, the entire body, which can help with the healing process during, with CRPS. I've seen it. It does work. So some of the aquatic exercise guidelines would be just pacing yourself. Less is definitely more in aquatic therapy. It is... There's a lot of resistance in the water. And with that resistance, there comes work. So you are working a lot harder in the water. And the reason why you don't feel like you are is because of that beautiful buoyancy that, that the water has. But you are still going against a lot of resistance. So you have to be very, very careful if you're going to start a program to start out really slow and take frequent breaks between exercises. So during those breaks, you can do your visualization. You can do your um, deep breathing, your diaphragmatic breathing, all of that helps to just reduce the stress. And these are things that are great to practice. You can progress the exercise time slowly over several weeks and make sure that you drink plenty of water. People get dehydrated when you're in the pool. You don't realize it, but you're not drinking the water. I hope. So you want to rest when you get home because your first few sessions are going to be so you want to make sure you give your body the fluids and the rest in order to recover. You need that recovery time. And you want to practice good nutrition and sleep habits, and we've heard a lot about that today, which is extremely important. If you practice good nutrition along with your therapy, you are going to have better results. So great to make sure you monitor your activity level. There's a Borg scale. Maybe some of you have heard about it before. It's just a rate of perceived exertion, and it's like the pain scale. It's 0 to 10 or sometimes 0 to 20, just depending on which, which scale that you look at. And you can track the exertion. We use this in the clinic because I don't want to over-fatigue the patients. When you get over-fatigued, you don't recover as well, and then you don't have as good of a progress. So you can start, number one is no activity, and I usually start patients at 2 to 3, where they're able to breathe easy and they don't feel a lot of stress in their body. And then you move up to four to six, where you can still carry on a conversation. And you do this slowly and monitor the fatigue level during the session so that you don't over-fatigue yourself later. So if you, can, you may need more breaks that day. You don't know. Maybe you, you're having a more difficult day. So you can only handle two to three, and you have to take a lot of breaks. Other, I mean, technology is great. You have your, your fitness apps. You've got your daily step monitoring. And even if you were to start out walking five to 10 steps a day, just five to 10 a day, you could monitor that. And then you can keep track of it and set yourself a goal. Three weeks from now, I'm going to walk 20 steps. So you can go as small or as large as you want, but give yourself a goal, something to achieve, something to make you feel like you are accomplishing something when it's so difficult. You can monitor your heart rate. And just see where you're at when you, when you do a little bit of activity. Monitor your heart rate if your Borg scale is a four, just to see what it's doing to your cardiovascular system. You can keep a diary of, of uh, your fatigue level and your comfort level. Use the same thing as you would a pain scale. Problem solve around your environment, meaning if you want to go to the movies, problem solve and figure out how you're going to get there. Don't just not go, but how are you going to plan to be able to go? What's it going to take? So the goal in all of this is to decrease the sensitivity of your nervous system 
to create a healthier body and mind. Some tips on how to succeed. You need to be a part of your solution. Ask questions of your physical therapist. Give information to your PT. And you must be compliant with the whole program that they're asking you to do. And if you can't be, you need to tell them. Say, you know, I'm having a lot of trouble doing this particular part at home. I'm getting really tired. And we can modify it. We can change it so that it can work for you. And you need to ask a support system for help. Find an advocate that can help with just being on you about doing your home program. Everybody needs that, like a coach, a coaching person. So I wanted to um, give you some brain reta uh, retraining and education resources. And these are some of the resources that my patients have found really helpful and my staff to look at. Um, the Recognize app, that's the great, great app. The Protectometer is, is the book. It's like a workbook that patients can use by Laura Mosley and David Butler. Explain Pain is another book that kind of gives a lot of pain education and what's going on with the nervous system in terms that anybody can understand. I just like the, the Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Doidge. I think he gives a lot of hope because he talks so much about the brain plasticity and he's written several other books as well. Phantoms in the Brain, if you're interested in learning about what goes on there by Dr. Ramachandran is an interesting read also and very educational. Why Does Everything Hurt by Adrian Lowe. He is another one that is starting to get um, some real traction with therapeutic pain education, which has been shown to make a big difference on how patients perceive pain. Some aquatic resources. Aquatic section of the American Physical Therapy Association is an excellent resource. The Aquatic Exercise Association is another one. Aquatic Therapy and Rehab Institute, the good, good things um, on that website as well. The Wet Wrap, you guys saw that last night, you know, at the, uh, at the silent auction by DK Douglas Company. It's a wrap that you don't have to pull over your head. It's made out of wetsuit material, so it's easy to get on and off. And if you have the opportunity to be in a pool, and maybe, maybe it's an outdoor pool, or even an indoor pool, and you feel chill, or you feel like you need a little bit more warmth, this is a great way to get it. And it just is, it's just a wrap, so it's easy to put on and off. And they also make custom sizes, too. Um, I've used Sprint Aquatics equipment quite a bit. That's a good website. It has a lot of different items on there that you can get. And the Millennial Pro crutches, when I saw people last night and some having regular crutches, um, I used this type of crutch, which is completely different, um, has springs on the bottom of it. So there's a lot less shock to your body. This is something just if you're on crutches and maybe something to look into. Also, the handle is ergonomically designed. But it helped me a great deal during the time that I was on them for an extended period of time. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you.